different reasons, as I've just been teasing you with. Uh, it was the night they believed the Whitechapel murderer claimed his third and his fourth victims, Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes, within an hour of each other. Right? Two murders in one hour. Uh, that's why it became known as the double event, for obvious reasons. Nobody was ready for two murders, believe you me, especially as uh, the second one of those two was the worst one up to that point. Um, but other things happened that night as well, which caused a lot of controversy and argument amongst the authorities then, and these things still cause a lot of controversy and argument amongst researchers and historians now. So it's all exciting stuff, as I'm sure you can imagine, and I'm going to make you wait for it. <laughs> for the simple reason that we have two stops left on the tour, Gorston Street and Mitre Square. They are important locations that relate to that double event. They're down that way. And to go down that way, we have to go past this neighbourhood, just as well. So we'll come back to that in a minute, but I'll make it up to you. This is where we go over what many people believe was the last of the five murders. It took place on the 9th of November, and the victim was Mary Jane, or Marie Jeanette, as she likes to call herself, Mary Jane Kelly. Now, she is widely regarded, I think, rightly actually, as the most famous of all the victims. There's good reasons for that as well. For a start, we know that all the victims pretty much were in their 40s, which is not old today, is it? No, no, no. That's, it. that's what I was looking for. Um, but obviously, life is East End prostitutes was harsh. It showed, all right? Mary Jane Kelly is believed to have been in her mid-twenties, only about 25 when she died. So even though she had the same lifestyle as an East End unfortunate, it hadn't got to it yet. Lots of people talked about how pretty she was, how lively and, and fun to be with she was. Some say she drew beautifully, that she sang well, and all the rest of it. You can imagine there's quite a lot of romance about Mary Kelly, especially when you think of the young life cut tragically short, which is what a lot of people think of her as being. Um, we know a lot about the victim's past, right? But with Mary Kelly, what we know about her past all came from her. Right? And nobody then or now has been able to prove that any of that background actually happened. So she's quite mysterious and has a habit of attracting various stories, right? none of which we know are true. One of them I'll relate, relates to where we are. That building over the road, which was built in 1860, was once a hostel for homeless men and women. And it was run by Catholic nuns, the Sisters of Mercy, Order of Nuns. And you can see there's the old women's entrance on there and there's a men's entrance around the side actually. Mary Jane Kelly was apparently Irish. One assumes she'd be Catholic for that reason. And being holed up in the East End, that's the sort of place that would welcome her, I suppose, with open arms. We don't know if she lived there, right? There's nothing to say she didn't, but it's one of the many mysteries. Mary Kelly has pretty much become East End folklore, like the man who killed her. And the other reason she stands out and is different is because she's the only victim killed indoors, properly. Because she was the only one who had a room of her own at the time of her death, rather than a lodging house bed. For the last eight months of her life, she lived in a notorious thoroughfare known to all as Dorset Street. Do you remember me mentioning that earlier on? Where Annie Chapman's lodging house was. Dorset Street used to come out, it would have gone through that building site, and it would have come out directly opposite the refuge, just over there. And if you'd have stood pretty much over the road and looked towards the church, that is what you would have seen. That is Dorset Street. Photograph the year the Daily Mail, a top British newspaper, called it the worst street in London. Right, so it's in the Daily Mail, so it's got to be true. Um, actually, the San Francisco Chronicle called it the wickedest street in London. Um, there aren't many pictures of Dorset Street. It wasn't really the sort of place you would take a camera with you. Right. Even the police were believed to have walked down it in pairs or more, simply for their own protection. Locals called it Dosset Street because of the amount of Doss houses there, and in fact some just called it The Street. You called it The Street, they knew exactly what you were talking about. Very, very criminally oriented, very dangerous as well. Mary Jane Kelly actually rented a room in Miller's Court, Dorset Street, a little alleyway with furnished rooms in it. Unfortunately, she got room 13. And she'd lived there, yeah, she lived there from February 1888. She is expected to pay four shillings and six pence a week, every week, routinely, for that little 10 foot by 12 foot partly furnished hovel. Obviously, life as an East End prostitute is not predictable. On the 9th of November, that morning, her landlord, John McCarthy, who owns not only all the properties in Miller's Court, but basically most of Dorset Street as well, was doing his books and realised how many times Mary had skipped the rent. So he thought, right, enough's enough. And at quarter to 11 that morning, he sent Thomas Bowyer, his uh, dedicated elderly assistant, round to Miller's Court to basically hang on the door, get her up, and get as much of that money off her as he could. This is Mary Kelly's room, photographed from the outside that morning by the police. So you can see what a sort of horrible looking place it was. Thomas Bowyer kept on knocking, didn't get any answer. He wasn't put off, he just thought, well, she's, 
not answering because she knows why I'm, why I'm here. So we went round to the smaller of those two windows, noticed that one of the panes of glass had been knocked through. A couple of weeks before, Mary Kelly had got into a massive drunken argument with her boyfriend, who was by that point then her ex-boyfriend. She threw something through the window because she was that drunk and the window hadn't been repaired. Right? Something get broken in Dorset Street and stayed broken. Thomas Bowyer put his hand in the gap, pushed aside the curtain, and peered in the room, thinking he'd see her hiding in the corner, hiding from him. Well, basically, what he saw in that room that morning would stay with him for the rest of his life. And in fact, even experienced, hardened detectives who had to go in that room that morning out of duty wrote about it in their memoirs more than two, three decades later and still talked about how much it, it horrified them. Mary Kelly was lying on the bed in the corner of the room, reduced to a pile of flesh, blood, exposed bone and dismembered organs. She'd been literally ripped to pieces. There is no other way to describe it, really. Now, shall I describe it? <coughs> yeah, describe yeah. it. Oh, well. Right. Now, normally I don't, right? I don't. Well, you'll see why in a minute. But it's Halloween, isn't it? So I'll go for it. This, by the way, the post-mortem report that still survives is over eight pages long. So I apologise if you're getting the potted version. Still not very nice. From the top, the face had been hacked beyond all recognition. The only way that people who knew Mary could recognise her was from the colour of her eyes and hair. Right? The head was hanging on by the bones of the spine alone. There were even knife marks in the vertebrae caused by the grinding of the knife. The flesh from the throat right down to the legs had been stripped off, all down to the rib cage. That was all lying on the bedside table in a horrible heap. Um, everything in her body was now outside her body. So they found all these organs lying around her on the bed, under her head, some of these things were under her feet, or on the bedside table with everything else. There were cuts in the fingers, chunks got out of the arms. It was a horrific mess, basically. Um, is that all right? Now, obviously it's the worst of the murders, believe you me, okay? And a lot of people think the reason it was so extensive and so graphic is because this is the only time the killer had privacy which enabled him to just keep on going. So there was nothing else he could do to this poor woman. But not only that, right, the privacy was quite useful for the police as well. In those days, police uh, photography wasn't new, but police photography was, right? In those days, they did not take any pictures of the Ripper's victims lying in the street because it was too dark, the cameras didn't cope, and of course, um, what can we say about it? Crowd control, panic, you know, that kind of stuff would have got seriously in the way. Um, this is different. There's a room. A photographer can go in there, take pictures without being molested by the crowds, and he can get a police to guard the door. And that is why we have two photographs taken that morning. The only time they ever photograph a Ripper's victim where they were found. Right? I have the most famous one here. Has anyone seen it before? Anyone knowingly seen this famous picture before? Have you seen it before? Have you seen it before? You have, right. Do you want to see it? Not really. Who wants to see it over here? Because you've seen it. Okay, right. Um, this comes with a public warning. I know we do have some youngsters here. This is not a lady cleaned up and propped up in a mortuary for our benefit. All right? This is basically what you would have seen if you'd looked through the window that morning. No other image demonstrates the, you know, the horror of the murders more than this does. So it comes with a public health warning, in other words. Uh, so, what was it? Okay. Actually, I just remember something. <laughs> Dr. Thomas Bond, Chief Surgeon of Scotland Yard, and his two assistants spent over four hours, some say six, not only doing the post-mortem, but actually putting the body back together again. That is how extensive it was. It, I, know, I just thought something else. Um, all the organs, though, were found in the room around her, except one, the heart. The heart had been taken away. Never found, and again, taken away for reasons that I guess we'll, ne we'll never understand. You can take it now. Yeah, of course. <laughs> take things so far, you know what I mean? Um, that picture will take a bit longer to go round, right? So when we move on, don't stand around waiting for it. Follow us, it will come with us, and we'll all get a chance to see it. There is an escalation in these murders, with one exception, actually, each one's worse than the preceding one, and this was the worst of the lot, and there was nothing like this afterwards, to be honest with you. And that is one of the reasons that many detectives at the time described this as the awful glut in Miller's Court, where the killer's mind probably gave way altogether. It suggests the ultimate breakdown. And that maybe after this he could have been a gibbering wreck, couldn't function as a normal human being, might have got him in, sectioned and incarcerated as a lunatic, or he may have realised the gravity of what he'd been doing and basically had a meltdown and killed himself, you know. Um, but that's one of those, some of the reasons why they think 
that Mary Jane Kelly's murder was the sort of natural conclusion. There's nowhere else to go after this. You know, nothing else you can do to a human body. Mary Jane Kelly, very famous, and certainly, for most people, the last victim. But she's not the last of ours, because we're going to go and do the controversial night at the double event down the road. Any questions before we move on?